So today we're going to be discussing everybody's favorite topic, sin. Something that we love to point out in other people, but get very uncomfortable when our own sin is pointed out. We love to make a big stink about hot button issues or call out others. People will all the time tell pastors that they should condemn this certain people group from the pulpit. They should call them out and condemn them. What about the guy who cheats on his taxes? Ah, that's not fun. What about the person who gossips at work? Ah, that's not sexy. So what's the deal with sin? Is all sin equal or are some sins worse than others? What does the Bible have to say? Let's take a look. Attention, bargain shoppers. Okay, so this is a very broad topic with a lot of rabbit holes we could go down. So to make things simple, I have come up with three questions that I think people might have or find interesting. And we'll do our best to explore what the Bible has to say about them. Number one, are all sins equal? Number two, is there a sin you cannot be forgiven for? And number three, how should we judge sin in other people? Okay, number one, are all sins equal? This is a very common question and I want to talk about it. But I'm going to be upfront with you that I hate this question because of how it's so often used. I mean, if you were being cynical, you could reword this as, are all sins equal because I'd really like to cast judgment on others so that I don't feel so bad about my own brokenness. Let's make a list so I can call others out and know who to judge. My hope, dear viewer, is that you, watching, are exploring this out of theological curiosity. What does the Bible say about it? And not trying to elevate yourself above other believers. So I just like this question, but from a theological perspective, not all sin is equal. The Jewish people in the Bible used different words for sin, kind of like an Eskimo uses a million different words for snow. A popular one is the root word kata in the Old Testament, hemartia in the New Testament, which means basically missing the mark, it is the most common word used for sin in the Old Testament. And you can kind of look at it as not arriving at your destination. This could mean something like having pride and, and making a decision instead of being patient and waiting on the Lord, or rushing into something unprepared, messing up, missing the boat. It seems to be described as a moral failure, yes, but one that we kind of make as we go about our daily lives. Remember, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't sound too bad, right? Then you have words like the root word pasa, which means rebel. So this would be used for a person or a people group who are openly rebellious towards God. You've got the root word rasa, a wicked person. So this would be not just one sin, but someone who is living a wicked life, oppressing the poor, exploiting people, something like that. So there's obviously degrees of sin, but all sin, no matter how small, separates us from God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Meaning if you sin, you will die. Referring to a spiritual death. And we should note that the word used here is hemartia, the one about the everyday sins or missing the mark. So why is it that something as simple as missing the mark will separate us from God for eternity. The reason is because God is pure love and without sin, and he wants to draw us all into his kingdom. But if he just opens the gates and lets sin in, any sin, heaven is no longer a perfect place. Picture it like you really want to drink this glass of water. Looks good, doesn't it? But what if I told you that I peed in it just a little bit? Just a little bit, no big deal. There's way more good liquid in here than bad liquid. Would you drink it? I wouldn't either. But Romans 6.23 continues, For although the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Lord Jesus. So on one hand, all sin is not equal. There are varying degrees of sin, and because God is a just God, there are varying degrees of his justice. More on that in a later video. However, on the other hand, all sin has the same effect on our connection with God. And most importantly, through our connection with Jesus, all sin is forgiven. One sin is not harder for God to forgive than another sin. Nor does quantity matter. The person with way more sins can still be forgiven the same by God. In fact, I'm reminded of the prostitute in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. He who is forgiven little loves little. So I'm going to end the first question with a roadmap of how to approach your own sin. First, pursue righteousness. Psalm 34, 14 says, Depart from evil and do good, seek peace, and pursue it. 
Pursuing it means genuinely and passionately trying. Make the choice to try to live in a way that honors God. Understanding that you and others will fail at times. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. A righteous man isn't aiming to fall. Sometimes he misses the mark, goes off track, but get up and keep moving forward. And remember in 2 Corinthians it says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. But Adam, I hear you say, did Jesus not say, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven of all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Great question, dear viewer, which brings us to question number two. Is there a sin we cannot be forgiven for? So sometimes Christians read this verse and we get a little twinge of fear. What if I accidentally say something that's blasphemous against the Holy Spirit? What if I was an atheist before I became a believer? So first, a little context. Mark wants us to understand blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in relation to what's happening in this story. So a little setup, Jesus is casting demons out of people and a huge huge crowd is formed around him. And the teachers of the law, people who are feeling threatened by Jesus' growing popularity, have come down from the big city, from Jerusalem, and they're trying to spread rumors and discredit him. So they're in the crowd saying to people, he is possessed by Satan, by the prince of demons is where he's getting his power from. So they're witnessing these miracles, works of the Holy Spirit, and they are attributing these miracles to Satan and his power. Now Jesus knows that they're saying these things and he knows why they're saying these things to discredit him. And he knows also that they may or may not actually believe what they're saying. They're just doing it to get to Jesus. They're not trying to honor Satan really, just trying to discredit him. But Jesus warns them, you're flirting with danger. Jesus does not say that these teachers of the law have committed an unforgivable sin. And interestingly, he doesn't call them out directly, but he speaks to the crowd and they obviously hear him because they're in the crowd. And in verse 28, he tells you, truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every blasphemy uttered. Is it possible that Jesus is trying to demonstrate God's grace to the teachers of the law? Kind of like, listen, I know you're slandering me, the son of God, but it's possible for you to be forgiven for that if you repent. And something else to consider as well. Jesus says all sins and every blasphemy can be forgiven. It's interesting that he doesn't say almost every sin and almost every blasphemy can be forgiven, except instead he starts with saying every blasphemy can be forgiven. Why is this? Follow me on this one. If you accept Jesus into your heart, you receive the Holy Spirit. There is a little theological debate around the timing of that, but either way, you're entitled to it at the moment of salvation. Ephesians 1.13 says, You heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you, and when you believed in Christ, he identifies you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8, 9 says, If you do not have the Spirit, then you do not belong to Christ. So from a theological perspective, being saved equals having the Holy Spirit. So you're forgiven of any blasphemy when you hear the message of truth and believe in Jesus Christ, just like Ephesians 1.13 promises. That's why Jesus says that any sin or blasphemy can be forgiven. But Jesus goes on to say that you can't be forgiven if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. So if accepting Jesus and God's word equals having the Holy Spirit, then not accepting Jesus or God's word equals not having the Holy Spirit, a.k.a blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It means you've never repented, you've never believed, as in you've denied God your entire life. You see, this statement by Jesus is a warning to the Pharisees. It's not about an accidental slip up or anything that happened before you were saved or mistakes you've made or anything like that. Jesus is speaking to a specific audience for a specific reason. And even in that, he offers God's grace and forgiveness to the people that are against him. I will end this question now with some words from Jesus. John 6, 37, he says, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Third and final question, how should we judge sin in others? So as humans, it's kind of built into our DNA to judge other people. Maybe it goes back to some survival instinct because if someone in the tribe does something funky, it puts everybody in the tribe at risk. I don't know. But Jesus has some strong words to say about judgment. Matthew 7, 1, he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. 
And later in the chapter, Jesus tells a story about judgment, saying, Do not worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye. Worry about the plank in your own. And this type of judgment is unhealthy judgment. It comes from a place of insecurity. It leads to gossip. It destroys relationships and communities. It's prideful. But there is a time for Christians to judge other people. Under what circumstances, you ask? Great question, YouTube watcher. I'll give you some examples. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul isn't in the city of Corinth. But he heard about some things going on there and he decided to write to the church. He heard that a member of their congregation was living in incest. And Paul reprimands the church for not doing anything about it, for allowing him to participate in what they're doing. He says the church isn't to associate with him or her or even eat with him. Paul is instructing the church to take sin seriously and not overlook a member of the church who is living in sin. However, a lot of people are quick to run to that verse and use it as just a blanket to cast judgment on others. This is the basis for excommunication that a lot of cult leaders use as a threat to their believers to kind of keep them under their control. But I'd like to point out a couple of things. Number one, it was wasn't just a sin. It was a sin that even the people around them who were considered to be sinners, they didn't approve of this. 1 Corinthians 5.1 says, even the pagans do not tolerate this. Second thing I want to point out is Paul is speaking not about somebody who committed a sin, relapsed into sin. This is somebody whose identity was tied to his sin. This isn't the guy who got drunk once or even gets drunk regularly or has a problem with alcohol. This is the guy running illegal booze during the week and then coming to church on Sunday. And the sin was apparently so bad, Paul wasn't even in the city at the time and he heard about it. This was before internet and email. And then Paul even goes on to say that he's not telling the church not to associate with sinners. Only the people who call themselves brothers and sisters who are leading this sort of double life. So I'll end with this. It's easy to judge others, especially when their sin is obvious or public. It's self-gratifying to point out the speck in your neighbor's eye. But grace is more powerful than judgment. And I want to encourage you to focus on the sins in your own life, to live honestly and justly, treat others with respect and with grace, and not get caught up in the trap of prideful judgment. Worry about your own plank. Let God take care of your neighbors. Well, that's all I got here for you today. Feel free to leave a comment below. I'll do my best to respond. If you liked the video, please feel free to like and subscribe. It does help out the channel. I'll also list the verses below that I used today. My name is Adam. This is Bargain Bin Theology. And remember, you get what you pay for.